an amazing day it is to be alive, everybody. I hope you're super, super psyched. I hope you're pumped up out of your minds because today it is the vigil of the Ascension. It is May 25th, Wednesday, and I'm your boy, Jeremiah Bannister, the one and only Paleocrat, right here on Paleocrat Diaries. Come on now. <laughs> We're going to rock out. We got a mega dope show for you today. We do. It's true. It's true, because why? Because we're going to be talking about Kingdom of the Cult. We're continuing. If you missed out on any of the series on apologetics, you've got to go back. We've got a playlist down in the description below. But before all of that, before all of that happens, we must do what we always do. Resolving deep inside to take a knee for Jesus Christ, Christ the King, all power, all authority right now in heaven and on earth. We take a knee for him every day, don't we? Resolving in our hearts to never give up, to keep on smiling, and to remember that one day we too shall die. So what do we got to do? What do we got to do? We got to do what my daughter did. Her birthday, by the way, was Sunday. Thank you to everybody who made my Sunday. It's bittersweet, but you made it awesome. You made it totally awesome. And we got to honor that. And how do we do it? By dreaming bigger thoughts. By recognizing those gifts and talents. Every thought, word, and deed for him advancing forward. Because we live in wicked times. We got to know what we believe. We have to know why do we believe what we believe? What do other people believe? Why don't we believe that stuff? <laughs> you got good reason. You got good reason. And we've got answers. We are able to give a defense. That's what this show is about. That's what this apostolate is about. All of meaning of Catholic. All of reason and theology. All of paleocrat diaries. To equip you to live out your faith in this world. And we've been going through all sorts of crazy stuff. All sorts of crazy things. Enthusiasms, heresies, sects, various cults. And today, we're talking about a wicked bad one. <laughs> real bad. We're talking a real, real bad cult. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, by the way, love you guys. Love you. And, and you know what? I'm not even joking. I'm not even joking about how grateful I am. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them up here right now. I am grateful for you. You just don't even know. Like, let me get sentimental for a second, okay? Because I had some weirdo. I had some weirdo in the comment section <laughs> of one of a, a recent video talking about the idea of keep on smiling. And came at me, by the way. Came at me saying that I failed to correct my daughter for her anti-Logos uh, uh, worldview. Why? Because she had cancer. And she was saying, never give up, keep on smiling. Now, you may, you may hear that and think, what the heck is this dude's problem? Trust me, I'm with you on that. <laughs> I'm with you on that. What is she supposed to do? And the idea, it was like he was thinking it was like a Stepford Wives thing. Like that SpongeBob episode where, you know, uh, Mr. Krabs sells the, the you know, <laughs> the Krusty Krab. He sells it, and then he comes back to work over there, and Squidward is like, smile, they're watching, kind of thing. Like, he thinks that's what it is. You know, some people mourn when, when people die, you know. Obviously, dude. Why do you, th if, if, if it was an idea that we're always doing this thing all the time, smile, don't let anybody know you're sad, number one, they haven't watched the show. They haven't watched the show. They don't know anything about anything to do with your boy, with my daughter's story, why we have that owl behind us there, that shield, nothing. The guy was Dumbo, Dumbo on steroids. But it's one of those things where here's a perfect example. You sit there and you say, man, for five years, for five years, I mourned my daughter. It was three days out of the year, her birthday, the day she died. And Christmas Eve, those days for me have been really painful, just on a personal level, you know, where, where the day we kind of, you know, we're going through different things and for Christmas Eve is more for me than for others in my family. But the other two days, her birthday and the day that she died, those, her, her birthday in heaven, right? That, uh, those days are particularly tough. And every year they come around and you, it's like, it's like, you know, how ladies do nesting ladies. Come on, tell me, you know, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, fathers, husbands, you know, right. The nesting thing. It's like the due dates coming and all of a sudden the wife is all over the house cleaning up. 
you know, or, or if, if the in-laws are coming. Uh, all of a sudden, the wife is like really ticked off because something's wrong in the house. There's something inside that's like a prepar- preparation phase. That kind of thing happens with our family, right? We know these days are coming. We don't even have to think about it. You just know it's happening. And it's, it's unfortunate. It's bittersweet. And on her birthday, she would have turned 18 this year on Sunday. And it was one of those things where, you know... You go through it, and, and I, 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 it was sad, and my family goes to sleep, and I'm awake, and I'm up at night, and, you know, just talking with the people on the chat, at the Wolfpack chat, if you're not part of that, you're out of your mind. <laughs> it's awesome. Amazing people. But for the first time, and this is, this is year six, for the first time, I didn't cry alone. I played, I played a video of somebody, a friend, Christine, sometimes you'll see her in this chat, Christine. She sang a song. She sang Tiny Dancer. And she sent it to us. The, the organist from her church played piano for her while she sang. And it was awesome. Just sent it in private. Told the story behind it. Really important to our family. She is. And that song, of course. But she sang it. I shared it in the Wolf Pack. I read, I read the, what's, what is going to be the introduction to the book. right About her life and death with childhood cancer. And how it led our family back to the faith. I read it aloud to everyone in the chat. And for the first time, I wasn't crying alone. And I thought, I genuinely love you guys. You've changed my life. This, this show has changed my life. This apostle has changed my life. So, all right, we're going to talk real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. I had to say it. And, I, and thank you for letting me, during those couple days, I shared a whole bunch of just memories, pictures, videos, stuff like that, with my daughter. It was awesome. It was awesome. And the love that they show for my daughter is powerful. And so I can't even begin to tell you how truly grateful I am. You're amazing people. And it's an honor to do this show. So, okay. Wesley, what's up, bud? (laughs) Yeah. Mm. Templar, this is going to be fun. It's always fun, homie. It is always fun. Sean McKenzie, happy Star Wars Day, y'all. I don't know, man. Is it really? Is it really Star Wars Day? I don't know much about it. I've never been much of a Star Wars guy. Kind of a Star Trek guy. Although, I kind of have a cutoff, you know, after anything to do with Captain Kirk. <laughs> Anything after that, I'm like, bah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Let's see here. Um, back up here. For our fathers of three Hail Marys, this heresy shan't stand. <laughs> yeah, okay, not not knowing about Star Wars. Oh, buddy. Yeah, let's see here. Rachel says, good morning, Paleo Christ. It's good to see you, by the way. It's good to see you. Yes, it's going to be fun, of course. Let's go. We got to do it. We got to do it. Not sure if it'll be mentioned, but everyone should watch the documentary Going Clear. Yes. And this will be more than just one episode. This is more than one episode. Let's see. Boom. We have the keys. (laughs) Christopher. Yes, dude. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We have have a visible church with a divine constitution. We got recourse to her. Yes. We have recourse. It is the bride. The Lord is the head and guides the feet. We are always safe in the bark, Peter. Let's see, the traditional Thomas, this man, I love the hype. <laughs> what are you talking about? This is me normal. <laughs> this is, you know, hype, what are you talking about? Let's see, uh, we're dunking on Scientologists, get hyped. Yes, we got to do it. Laughs in Tom Cruise, jumping up and down on Oprah's couch. Uh, you know, you got to do a video of that. If you're really doing that and you're not lying to us, because I got a feeling you're lying. <laughs> you're not really doing that. You're not really doing that. Let's see, yeah. Uh, evangelize with SpongeBob, this is the way. <laughs> I can imagine that, that GIF, right? What is that from? Right? You got the guy in the, the, the night. He's got the, the helmet on and everything. It's like, this is the way kind of thing, yeah. Let's see. Um, clueless, people who have never lost loved ones. I, I know, and look, pray for that guy. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he was saying basically that it's that you're it's pretend. She's praying, playing pretend to have the phrase, the, the motto, never give up, keep on smiling. And I said there was a third one. We're all going to die. All of us. So there's no pretend about that. And keep on smiling. That's like telling somebody to get back up. Like unless you're unless you're some cynical weirdo that sits there and thinks you're literally saying, keep on smiling right now. Like a gun to your head. You're like, what? I said, keep on smiling. Okay. Yeah. It's not good enough. <laughs> you little cancer girl. What a, what a weirdo, man. What a weirdo. 
Yeah, some people, you know, some people mourn when people die. Really, dude? I carried my daughter out. She died where I'm sitting right now. I carried her body in my arms. If you think I'm sitting there with some weird smile on my face. And it was, it, the question was, is it, is it right? Are you encouraging to people smile even when it's not appropriate? What? Like seeing a little baby getting hurt and you're sitting there. <laughs> no, dude. Sicko. Says more about you, man. What a weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> what a weirdo. And then he got mad. He's like, you're not, you're not accepting correction. Of course I'm not accepting correction from some rando online with a, with a bunny profile picture. Nah, man. Do better. Uh, 87, we love you, Jeremiah, even though you're a boomer on the audio. Oh, you hearing me today, buddy? Am I talking loud and clear, home? <laughs> I hope so, man. It's true. Kevin says, good morning, Wolfpack. God bless you and your family. Kaiser, taking a knee for Christ, pounding that snare in Georgia. Hmm. It's Spock Day. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. Yes, like, comment, share, subscribe. All right, well, I'll try to keep track of that. Look, if you want to, you see it on the screen. Kevin put at the meaning of Catholic. I'm signed in, as you can see at the bottom, at the meaning of Catholic. So if you'd like something specifically to me, it's easier to see that big orange rectangle than it is to see above it where 87 uh, Weberdex says, we love you, Jeremiah. I see my name there, but it makes it harder, okay? So if you want to make sure that I see something, make sure to put that in the orange square. And I'll try my best throughout the show to uh, to check in on it and see how it's doing. See how it's doing. Oh, no, hold on. Let me, let me, let me check something real quick. Give me a second with this. Give me a second with this. <laughs> What's this all about? Hold on. Hold on. All right. Okay. He should. There. That's better. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. So before we move on, last thing. We got to do it. Well, for one, remember, there's a show right after this. We do a live uh, after the Afterglow Q&A Super Show Extravaganza. It's an overflow show, and we do it right afterward. It's Q&A. It's kind of like a Skype, but it's on Telegram. You can be a lurker. You do not have to talk. You do not have to be on video. Uh, we do a lot of that stuff, but after each show, we do a, a quick Q&A, uh, stuff like that. This one will probably be more uh, informal, just kind of talking and stuff, um, but we do, we do live chats literally every day, at least two hours. I'd say probably about an hour and a half to two hours every single day on the chat, uh, a bunch of people. I mean, even at night, we'll do them really late at night, right, and you'll have... I don't know, 16, 17 people sometimes in there. Uh, the the Afterglow show sometimes has been over 20. It's been really cool to hang out with people in that in that chat. So it's it's been a whole bunch of fun. And we're doing something new over there, the Fat Shame to Fitness. So if you are sick and tired of being a fat slob <laughs> and you're sick and tired of, you know, uh, having to like lift up and like suck in your gut so you can tie your shoes, that sort of a thing. Or when you run, you feel like you've got a midget strapped onto the front of your body under your shirt. It's like, bleh, 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 going up and down. If you're sick and tired of that, you know, you're sick and tired of having more chins than a Chinese phone book. If you're sick and tired of that, a pack of hot dogs on the back of your neck. <laughs> if you're sick and tired of getting a cut on your finger and gravy coming out. <laughs> if you're sick and tired of that in your life and you want something that's not this, this extremely difficult thing, that says that it's not it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle, while they're super restrictive on your food, and instead you want to do something this simple, okay? And do it with other cool people, including your boy, because that's what I'm doing right now, okay? Eat when you're hungry, only eat till you're full, but know what it means for both. Know what it means to be hungry, to hunger after food, to hunger after God, to be bored, to distinguish between hunger and emotional eating, things like that, comfort food, to get back down to the basics, to feel, to, to react to your body, to get into that rhythm, just like sleep that says, am I eating because I'm supposed to or I'm eating because I'm genuinely hungry? Am I eating because that looks good and because it's delicious like that General Tao's chicken that was staring me in the face yesterday? Or is it going to be that I'm genuinely hungry and without it, I'm not gonna be able to function? And then in between your food, in between your meals, you are in a state of fasting. You are, you are dedicating that time separated from food until your body lets you know again that you are hungry. And then back to the game. And, and not even we will never say anything about, well, you should stay away from this food or this and that. Look, that's up to you. 
but getting back to the basics and saying, get on your knees to the Lord and commit it back to him because we're all out of control, right? America is wicked fat. If you want to be part of that, I'm going to be doing a bunch of videos, but it's going to be exclusive over there. So you're going to definitely need to do that. I'm not going to put them on, on YouTube and stuff. That's a community project. And so if you want to be part of that and join others who are fat shaming themselves to fitness, <laughs> you can go ahead and find that in the description below. And we're going to show real quick, real quick thing for the Saint Maker. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. It's transformative. Okay. And, and I vouch for it. And more and more people are. I know when people buy it, right? I know because I'm, I'm, I'm an affiliate. So I see when people buy it. And it's awesome. The increasing number of people that are purchasing it using the promo code down below. So you can find that down below. But we're going to real quick show a little bit more information when we get back. Make sure, make sure you got your coffee ready. Make sure you got your, your pens and your pencils and your pads of paper, your paleocrat diary, where you take some notes because today we're talking about Mr. L. Ron Hubbard and his crazy, diabolical, deceptive, delusional cult. <laughs> we're going to Scientology. We're going to be talking about it. We're going to do that right after this. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself. But in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction. And our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though, so head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. You got to do it right there. Thesaintmaker.com slash Diary is promo code in the description below. It's the code. And speaking of the code right there, that is the special Morris Code, audibly going out into the world, letting all the paleocrats, the freaks and geeks, letting all of them know all around the world to let their friends and families, classmates and coworkers, even their frenemies, especially them, <laughs> especially the frenemies, to let them know that your boy is on the air and that today we're continuing with the kingdom of the cults. We're taking a break just for a moment from our, from our series on apologetics. Do you love that, by the way? Is it transformative, by the way? More emails, more messages, more people pumped about the faith and, and a loving debate than I've ever experienced before, <laughs> ever. It is powerful. You got to go check it out in the description. We're talking today Scientology. We're going into the, the octagon, right? To get in that rough and tumble with, with cultists, enthusiasts, heretics. And today, L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology. It's a wicked cult. So right now, release those carrier pigeons out into the world, to the north, to the south, to the east and the west. You gotta let them know, break out that snare drum, just like folks in the chat. Break out that guitar, break out that Marlboro. <laughs> Smoke signals up in the air, letting everybody know that your show is on the air right now. Like, comment, share, subscribe, get pumped. But most importantly, when we do this, it's a serious resolve. We're psyched, yes, it's true. <laughs> It's inevitable. It's inevitable. It's me and it's you. But the thing is, we got it resolved. This is serious business. This is serious business. It's the octagon for sure. It's the octagon for real. And it's the battle of our lifetime. It's why we're here. God put us here for a reason. It's not a joke. We can have fun, but this is a serious resolve. So take that knee right now. Do not be afraid anymore. No more shame. No more hiding your faith. No more being that candle underneath a bushel. And if so, put a, put a billow underneath it. Make it just get huge and light that bushel, light it on fire. Everyone's like, whoa, what's that? And you're like, it's me and I'm psyched. Why? Why are you psyched? 
because I'm a Catholic. I have a bazillion reasons to be pumped up. To be pumped up and ready to go, rip and roaring. And that's what we're doing right here when we're talking about Kingdom of the Cults to prepare you, right, to be a better witness in everything you say, in everything you think, and in everything you do. It's true. It's what we do. It is true. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. All right. We got to rock out of here. Let's do this. Okay. I love that song, by the way. What, what a great song. Yeah. Tim Flanders loves it. He plays these songs. My intro in that song, he, he loves them. <laughs> it's on his playlist. That's what, It's his ringtone. Ask him about it. I'm serious. Message him. <laughs> He'll be real happy about that. He'll be real happy. So, all right. This is chapter 12. I skipped over, by the way, I skipped over a couple things. Okay. So there was um there were there were some there were some other groups, right? In the cuz he talks about a whole bunch. I'll just I I don't think I ever did this where I said like some of the groups that he talks about in here uh in this book. And if you don't have the book, I encourage you to pick it up, right? I like going through it, but I also like it so that, you know, if people want to read along, that's great too. So to, to talk about the different groups, we've already talked about uh psychology and structure of cultism, right? The language, understanding the language barrier. Uh, but we did not, oh, we talked about um, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Spiritism. We mentioned a little bit about uh, the Theosophical Society, not not tons and tons. We talked about it a little bit. Um, and we talked about some other groups too, right? We talked, I forget which, oh man, the names of them. We talked about different groups um, throughout the series so far. And also, of course, the Word of Faith, we distinguished between a cult um, and an enthusiasm with them. Uh, same thing with the snake handlers. That's a fascinating thing. There's two There's two episodes on that. I think the Word of Faith is like five, five or six episodes, I think. Uh, you can find all of that, all of that in the master catalog, the master playlist. You can find that in the description below. But I skipped over Christian Science, uh, Church of Jesus Christ, or, uh, the, um, let me think here, Unitarian Universalism. We will talk about Unitarian Universalism and we'll talk about Christian Science as well. So we're going to talk about those. Um, but we, we already did a little bit anyway. Well, we we talked about we talked about um, new thought metaphysics. So we talked about new thought metaphysics. You know, we talked about that within the context of word of faith movement. Okay, so we already did that. So I skipped over those. We'll we'll return back to address some of that. We're also going to talk about Foursquare, right? Amy Semple McPherson, stuff like that. Um, but I I wanted to skip ahead because this is uh, up there next on the list for for groups more relevant. I think uh, bigger. And then we'll touch touch on some of the more the smaller ones, right? Like but Baha'i faith or something like that. You know, we'll talk about that. Mm. And so, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. And there's a whole bunch of of other groups after that. I don't know why I skipped over that. Um, there's a whole bunch of other groups here. So, like New Age, right? We'll talk about New Age because I want to talk about Mother of God, the the internet cult lady. She ended up dying, right? It's a sad and hilarious story. Um, Eastern religions, the Unification Church, Islam, okay, uh, the cults uh, on the world mission field, the Jesus of the cults, evangelism, hot road to recovery, stuff like that. It's all in here. And then, of course, we've got mystics and messiahs that goes into detail, not as deep. Like the chapters in that aren't as long. It's more of a cursory overview, a thumbnail sketch of many different cults. But that's going to that's gonna talk about some fascinating ones. Um, that, that I definitely want to touch on, right? Like Father Yod. I got I got to do one on, on Father Yod. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. The cat, the cat on the hang glider, you know, the cat, I, I've told this story before. The guy died with that on a hang glider, man, a powerful story. He's like, he's like, the spirit's telling me to get on a hang glider with no training at all. And they're like, Oh, are you sure? Like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm definitely good with this. And he gets on there they're, and they recorded everything. You can actually watch a documentary. It's kind of fascinating. It's not for not for children, um, but it's because uh, it's it's a hippie cult, All right? So you're dealing with like sex magic and junk. I mean, it's it it gets real weird, um, you know. But he gets out on out on that hang glider, and they got some video footage. Man, they got pictures of it. Dudes, you know, floating around <laughs> wearing like this, wearing some vestments, wearing this robe. So he's like he's like looking like some like Eastern looking priest on a hang glider. On the edge of a cliff, going out, and it was like, "Whoa, wow, man!" And then, <laughs> yeah, just shatters bones. Ends up in a real quandary too, because it's one of those situations where your beliefs end up being the very thing that did you in, and not because you, but because of your followers. 
right? You're begging, oh, come on. A mother of God, same thing with her, right? She's dying. She's dying. She's like, oh, I think I might need to go to the hospital maybe. And they're like, oh, no. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, you know, didn't you say something that if you ever say that, it's like you're like out of your body for a minute and maybe another spirit's in there and it's testing us. No, I'm being really serious. Didn't you say that you would also really say that you're serious? <laughs> and that, yeah, it happened. <coughs> oh boy, it happened. So, all right, historical perspective. The Church of Scientology is the most litigious, litigious religion in the history of churches founded in the United States. It's true. It's true. They, they love themselves some litigation. There's no doubt about it. They've been the plaintiffs in an enormous number of lawsuits compared with most churches and or religions, okay? Critics of Scientology claimed that they intended many of their lawsuits as malicious vendettas against ex-members and perceived enemies of the church, okay? Um, in our observation, it has all the marks of a religion. It has its own set of scripture. It holds a worldview and it seeks spiritual enlightenment. Now, this, this is technically true, Right. Of every, if you if you replace scripture with ultimate authority, right, or sa sacred text, something that sets apart something set apart for you, an enormous number of people have that without having themselves a Bible. It holds a worldview, right? Almost, you know, not every group does, but every person has one. Every person has one, and it seeks spiritual enlightenment. It's a common thing. It's a common thing. But this is a group, okay. So as a group, it has a set of scripture, it holds a worldview, and it seeks spiritual enlightenment. By biblical standards, right, we justifiably call this, in fact, a false religion. Now, you're going to have people, you know, I watched a debate months ago. I watched a debate uh, between these na uh, Nation of Islam dudes, or Nation of Islam and some other, you know, uh, radical group, <laughs> black nationalist group. And, and they're debating. Actually, it's kind of fascinating to watch the debates that go on in that universe. It's kind of wild. Um, the, the, the style of debate, the style of the way that they speak, the cadence and everything when they're debating. It's, it's, it's like blood sport, but in real life, like in front of everybody and not just on video and stuff. So, I mean, they're right there. They could, they could literally just punch them in the face. You know, and you, you can imagine sometimes there being like an organ off to the side. A keyboard's like, go, come on now, kind of, kind of thing, right? And that's happening during their debates. So it's, it's a fascinating thing. But it was a, a debate over Scientology because the Nation of Islam is, is down with the sickness. Unsurprisingly, we'll talk, of course, about Nation of Islam. Uh, that's, that's a sad story. That's a sad story. But, but you, the contention is it, does, it doesn't have any problem. It's just a philosophy of life kind of thing. It's like a utility. You just, you just, it's like getting a cell phone, you know? You get a cell phone because you want to do some talking. You buy some forks because you want to eat. You get yourself some Scientology. <laughs> you're like, that's your checkout list? And you're like, yeah, I, I'm picking up a little Scientology with that. And you're like, ah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a little syncretistic, homie. I think it's a religion. Oh, uh, no, it's not. Uh, yeah, it is. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. This chapter focuses on the theological aspects of Scientology. We will also examine its history to see how it came about. We do that every show. People, they, they say, why, why do you talk about the founders? And most of today is going to be, in fact, the founders, okay, or the founder. So we're going to talk about L. Ron Hubbard and his backstory, right? And some of the, some of the stuff maybe not even included in here, but included online. And so we'll talk about that. But the idea is that, you know, if you, if you have founders, it's good to talk about those folks. That's why we talk about the Lord. One of the reasons is the reason we talk so highly of the apostles, right? And of the patristics. And so every religion with their founders like this, it's important, I think, to understand who they are because it is from them from which these ideas came, them and a gaggle of demons. <laughs> oh. If the founder and the Church of Scientology have a questionable background, then the background warrants examination. I do not push that too far. I don't. I think that we, people can say that about our religion and they can say, and we say, well, yeah, we have, we're, we believe in redemption. We believe in the transformative power of the cross. Now in this situation, you say, well, what, what kind of wicked, wicked bad is it? Super deceptive. You know, if we went digging around in King David's past, what would it be? Right? So I don't push that too far. I don't push it too far. Just like I don't push the martyrdom claim too far in apologetics where you say, oh, well, these people died because they believed in the faith. 
Tons of religions have martyrs. Fine. And so I don't want to push that too far. The Dianetics movement was once seen as a 1950s fad. Within our definition of cultism, we described the Church of Scientology as a non-Christian cult, most definitely. So because you have Christian cults, and that's not to say that they're Christian in the sense that we, we say, it means that they have a bare minimum that their, their idea is centered around the person of Christ, right? Around, around the, the Christian religion as such. What is this movement called Scientology? Claims to be a church and an applied religious philosophy. So it's, it's, it's an applied philosophy. It's got religious, uh, and that's in quotations, by the way. Okay. So that's what it's saying. It's, it's an applied religious philosophy. L. Ron Hubbard, who is this guy? <coughs> you may have seen some pictures of him. You may have seen his gnarly teeth. <laughs> he has some nasty, nasty growlers. I don't know. I, have you ever seen that? What's up with Scientologists and their teeth, by the way? Have you ever seen Tom Cruise's teeth? You'll never unsee it. <laughs> you'll never you'll never unsee it. The symmetry is like way off. Wicked bad. You know. <laughs> it does something to you. I don't know. It does something to you, I think. That's that's what happens. You know, you, you get some Scientology, you get some gnarly teeth. You get some Scientology, you know, do do the old, you know, audit. Next thing you know, your center tooth is like over here. The founder of Scientology, Lafayette Ronald Hubbard, also known as L. Ron Hubbard, affectionately called Ron by Scientologists, was born on March 13th, 1911. So it's been a minute. He's a March baby. I'm a March baby. In fact, we got a bunch of March babies in this family. Okay. Um, he was born in Nebraska. Hubbard, a popular science fiction writer of the 1930s and 1940s, changed venues midstream by allegedly announcing at a New Jersey science fiction convention, quote, writing for, a, writing for a penny a word is ridiculous. If a man really wanted to make a million dollars, the best way would be to start his own religion. Now, that is, where is that cited? Time Magazine, April 5th, 1976. I'd like to go back and read that because it's a popular quote, but I can imagine it being not real. I'm glad at least that they put alleged in there, right? And it doesn't matter if he believed it, if he didn't believe it, no matter what, he ended up advancing an idea. And we can say this about a lot of cultists, right? Did they really believe it? Do, does the dude, does the Adventist guy with a bunch of polygamous, you know, he's a polygamous dude, got himself a bunch of the ladies, a bunch of the virgins, so that he can do different ceremonies and rites, apparently before the second coming, which he keeps predicting and failing on and stuff. And all that, but he keeps getting the ladies. They keep coming. I don't, I don't get that, <laughs> you know. But does that guy really believe it? When he explains to National Geographic, or on a video that was played on National Geographic, a documentary, when he explains on camera, revealing for the first time to his son in the with <laughs> around his son and former daughter-in-law, I say former because now she is his wife. <laughs> she is his wife now. And, the, and the, the son's like, what? And he's explaining the whole thing and how God, he was like on the ground and he gets on the ground and shows everybody this real awkward moment. It's like like right out of waiting for Guffman or something. It's that awkward. And uh, he gets on the ground. He's like, and I knew that the Lord was telling me I had to consummate with this woman, my daughter-in-law and make her my wife. Kind of thing. Did he really believe that? Or was he just, you know, kind of in the mood? <laughs> Doesn't matter. He did it. I mean, it does matter. We don't know though. Same thing here, I think. The following year, May 1950, Hubbard released Dianetics, a modern science of mental health. His first book on Scientology was published in 1951, and the Church of Scientology of California was incorporated on February 18th, 1954. So we're back in California. <laughs> What's going on with this, by the way? Any Californians in here? If Flashman's here, Flashman, I think, is from, Cal is from California. <laughs> I think he is, yeah. And so, um, <laughs> but there, it seems to be a lot of cults. It, it, it's misleading though, because I actually think that there's more cults in like uh, New Mexico, Arizona, in that area, I think, right? I've, I've heard rumor. <laughs> and I've wondered why, you know? And it might, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. If you've, got, if you've got ideas, let me know. Let me know in the live chat after the show too. His books often carry a short biographical sketch of his accomplishments, 
also described in Scientology Dictionary. Okay? And there's a quote. He traveled extensively in Asia as a young man. He studied science and mathematics at George Washington University, graduating from Columbia, Columbian College. He attended Princeton University and Sequoia University. Crippled and blind at the end of the war, World War II, he resumed his studies of philosophy and by his discoveries recovered so fully that he was reclassified in 1949 for full combat duty. It was a matter of medical record that he has been twice pronounced dead and that in 1950 he was given a perfect score on mental and physical fitness reports. By the way, I don't know if you've seen this, dude. I don't know if you've seen him. He's got some pictures like as he gets older and stuff. He kind of looks like like a, a portly version of the first doctor from Doctor Who. <laughs> you know, with but with gnarlier teeth kind of thing. His teeth were real jacked. His physical fitness in his mouth, his, his uh, um, hygienist would be like, I, I would not give him a perfect score <laughs> on that. And I don't think anybody seeing those pictures would give him a perfect score. He kind of looks like, you know, there's, there's a picture of Christopher Hitchens, the atheist guy. And he's in, I think he's in some tent somewhere and he's typing away. I don't know if it's a computer or a typewriter, but he's typing. He's got himself some liquor. He's got his cigarette, you know, down to the, down to the butt in his fingers. And uh, he's sweating profusely. It's a popular picture of him, but homeboy is sweating like a hog. Real sweaty, right? <laughs> All over his body. It's kind of what Elrond started looking like. So there may have been a time where he was fit and they have to hearken back to that because there was a time later when he was, you know, apparently really, really doing well with Scientology that he wasn't doing well with his weight. Yeah, so he wasn't in, well, he was in shape. It's like me, in fairness, right? It's not that I'm out of shape. I'm just in a shape that I think is not very awesome. <laughs> I got to change it, guys. I got to do some shape shifting. Got to do it. Several uh, competent writers have gathered contradictory ev evidence of Hubbard's exaggerated uh, Vita and have challenged his claims. None are so thoroughly damaging to his credentials than Russell Miller's Barefaced Messiah, the true story of L. Ron Hubbard, and former Scientologist Bent Corden's L. Ron Hubbard Messiah or Madman. Okay, so you've got these guys, they're like, okay, look, you put a claim out there about yourself like that. Next thing you know, you're going to have folks who are like, well, I think I'm going to look that up. I think I'm going to look that up and we're going to find out. Is it in fact true? Is it true that you were so mega dope in the military? Did you almost die? Is it proven? Were you ever handicapped? Were you ever blind? Declared dead twice? Were you given, you know, a perfect score in 1950? According to, yeah, fitness reports. Okay. Yeah. Miller showed that Hubbard attended high school in America while he was claiming to have been traveling Asia. That causes a problem. <laughs> so if you claim, hey guys, I was in Asia. And part of this, by the way, part of this, it's made even worse. It's made even worse in a day and age where we have the internet, right? Because if people, they get online for many years and they say the darndest things, right? Fake book, fake book really fueled this where you go, oh man, you know, I want, I'm going to tell everybody where I am all the time. Oh, I can check in. I can let the world know. Oh yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to let people know what I was eating, who I was hanging out with, what I went to see, what I'm reading, when I'm wiping my hiney, like it, literally everything. <laughs> nothing, nothing is, is, is private anymore. And then later they make claims and people go, oh, I'm going to go through your timeline. I'm going to go through the Wayback Machine. That's why I keep videos up. That's why I keep videos up and why I encourage people. I, I qualify things like, so far as I'm aware, I'm the person who coined the word Smith, who coined the word paleocrat. If I'm wrong, let me know. But that's something that's like, yeah, I, I, I used it. I had no reference to anything else. But if you say, yeah, I was in Asia. I was traveling around Asia. And you're like, wait a second, we got you here in the United States. You were in high school, weirdo. His medical records showed that he was never crippled blinded or wounded in World War II, let alone being pronounced dead twice. So if you go through and you find out and you say, wow, it's kind of weird, dude. Where does it ever say you were crippled? Where does it ever say you were blinded? Where does it ever say you were wounded? Ever. In fact, it's worse than that. It is worse than that. Let me go over here. Let me go look. Okay. 
Yeah, there's a website here about um, yeah, just a bunch of stuff here on um, on his life. Yeah, lied about being a war hero. Okay. Yeah. For example, he has this idea. He described his military experience like this. Blinded with injured optic nerves and lame with physical injuries to hip and back at the end of World War II. I face an almost non-existent future. My service record states, quote, this officer has no neurotic or psychotic tendencies of any kind whatsoever. But it also states, permanently disabled physically. And so there came a further blow. I was abandoned by family and friends as a supposedly hopeless cripple and probable burden upon them for the rest of my days. (laughs) By the way, does that remember? Yeah, a further blow. My family was like, you know what? I'm never talking to this guy again. He's a hopeless cripple. (laughs) What? Uh, He's going to be a burden on us. Let's walk away from this guy. Leave him on the streets. Yet I worked my way back to fitness and strength in less than two years using only what I knew about man and his relationship to the universe. Okay, so he's saying that he has an exclusively humanistic uh, um, frame, right? So it's exclusive humanism, exclusive secularism, detached all the way from supernatural, just about man. So I just know about man and his relationship to the universe. You can know a lot of things, by the way. You can know an awful lot. That's because man, no matter how you end up framing your espoused worldview, you're stuck with the idea that you are an ensouled creature created in the image and likeness of Almighty God. Yeah. And you live and move and have your being in the world that he created. So you're going to know a lot of things. (laughs) Even if you start at the wrong starting point. I had no one to help me. What I had to know, I had to find out. Oh, he had to get the monocle. He had to get the monocle. What I, what I had to know, I had to find out. And it's quite a trick studying when you can't see. <laughs> okay, man. I, I became used to being told it was all impossible. There was no way, no hope. Yet I came to see again and, and walk again, and I built an entirely new life. Sounds kind of amazing. This is over at Ranker. Sounds kind of amazing. Super dupe inspiring. Sounds like someone you could put your faith in. But wait! <laughs> but wait! Hold on! There's more. Here's what his actual career looked like. I, he was in the infirmary a lot. It wasn't for any of the deb- debilitating injuries he claimed he had to overcome. It was things for like, you know, headaches and such. <laughs> oh. He's like, oh, I'm not feeling good today. You're like, aren't you supposed to be on duty? Yes. Aren't you on watch today? I was, but I, I told him, my tum-tum is a little rumbly. I got I got the, a migraine, like right in here. Uh, uh, pressure. <laughs> oh, come on, man. What does it say? Quote, consider this officer lacking in the essential qualities of judgment, leadership, and cooperation. Not considered qualified for command or promotion at this time. Recommend duty on a large vessel where he can be properly supervised. (laughs) That's the deal, isn't it? With people who are not properly supervised, with people who are not properly supervised, leading a cult, not too good. Not too good at all. Yeah. Let's see, is there anything else I want to put from this right here I want to put on there? Okay, hold on. So I thought there might be one more thing from this website. We'll, we'll refer back to it in a little bit. You know, but about him in particular. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he was, he was a raging racist. All right, from his personal diaries, talking about China. Uh, they smell of all the bass they didn't take. The trouble with China is there's just too many in there. <laughs> in there. <laughs> wow, homie. <laughs> The South, the South African native is probably the one impossible person to train in the entire world. It's probably impossible by any human standard. Get yourself an N-word. That's what they're made for. What the? Wow. He's talking to his wife? Yeah, okay. So this dude. <laughs> so he was not only, you know, 
a, a you know a wuss. He was not only lying about a bunch of stuff. He's also just a, a real scumbag. A real scumbag. Ben Corden, formerly head of one of the the most successful Scientology missions, it's in Riverside, California. Let's get back home. In Riverside, California, has countless court transcripts, affidavits, and firsthand testimonies that lay many of L. Ron Hubbard's claims to rest. Hubbard's academic academic degrees have come, come under question since Sequoia University was discovered to be an undergra- uh, an unrecognized diploma mill. <laughs> so he's like he's like the word of faith people. You know, they're, they're, they're getting that thing passed out to him like candy. They're like, I'm doctor, doctor so-and-so. And you're like, oh, where'd you get that? Quackadoodle you. What, what, did, what did they do? They specialize in passing out doctorates like Pez from Pez dispensers. <laughs> okay. You know, you just lift it up and out comes the doctorate for me. You know, it was located in a, in a two-story house in Los Angeles. Wow, okay. It was closed down in 1958 by an act of the California legislature. So they're like, okay, it's got to go. <laughs> it was that bad, guys. It was that bad. They're like, I, even California. <laughs> California's like, can't handle it, guys. This is wicked, wicked, bad, dumb. It is true that he attended George Washington University for two years. He was placed on academic probation, as he said, for, quote, some very poor grade sheets. Although there are times he calls himself a, quote, nuclear physicist, he failed his only class on molecular and atomic physics. He also spent three months in a military course at the Princeton School of Military Government. Nothing has yet surfaced to confirm his alleged degree from Columbian College. See, yeah, Columbian College, I think I got it mixed up earlier with the university. Columbian College. And, and now, now this is, look, there may be things that have transpired since then. Maybe, maybe they've come up with stuff. Time happens. Maybe they've done some investigation. Maybe, you know, stuff has come up. They're, they love correcting people. They probably got people watching this show right now. In fact, to be quite frank with you, there's a good, there's a good idea that we could have a, a, they could be instituting the attack, the attacker policy. And that's just something I should have just let everybody know from the get-go. When you talk about culture, putting yourself out there, man, you are. You know, we, we, go to the, we go to the edges, don't we? We go to the fringe to talk to people to try to say, look, you got to get out of this cult, man. We, for one, you got to identify it as such. That's number one. And number two, you got to ask yourself, why in the heck are you in a cult? <laughs> why are you in a cult, man? You got to get out. And we, when we, we reach our hand out to help people because they're in a wicked place. And most people who find themselves there, you know, sometimes it's just fascination. Sometimes it's a bunch of other reasons why. But when you criticize these groups, like the Mormons, right? That sort of thing, right? Mormons and other groups, Scientology. In 1966, a policy letter from L. Ron Hubbard describes the church's brutal attack the attacker policy. Quote, this is correct procedure. One, spot who is attacking us. Okay, I'm your boy, Jeremiah Bannister. <laughs> Just letting you know. Two, start investigating them promptly for felonies or worse, using our own professionals, not outside agencies. Yeah, because that, be, that would be scumbag material. But that's okay. Yeah, go do that. Go do that. Double curve our reply by saying we welcome an investigation of them. So, so they're investigating. They're saying, look, we welcome an investigation. And all the while, what they're doing is they're investigating behind the scenes. They're encouraging their own thing. But it, get, it bolsters it. Start feeding lurid blood, sex, crime, actual evidence on the attackers to the press. Yeah. Holy cow. Watch out. M Live. <laughs> is it coming? Don't ever tamely submit to an investigation of us. Make it rough. Rough on attackers all the way. You can, you can get reasonable about, reasonable about it and lose. Well, yeah, because you're unreasonable, dude. That's why. You can't get reasonable about it. Because you will lose. Sure, we break no laws. Debatable. We're talking about that. Sure, we have nothing to hide. Also debatable. 
<laughs> Not even debatable at this point. It's just a flat out lie. Same thing with breaking no laws. A flat out lie. In fact, they didn't just break a law. We're going to talk about a huge problem. What was it? Was it Operation Snow White? But attackers are sim- uh, but attackers are simply an anti-Scientology propaganda agency, so far as we're concerned. Okay, so he understands the antithesis. We're pressing it hard. They've proven they have no facts. <laughs> They've proven they have no facts. Can you imagine that's like proven? The idea, you're, you're, you're trying to prove it. You're like, what are you trying to prove? I'm trying to prove I have no facts. And will only lie, no matter what they discover. So banish off ideas that any fair hearing is intended and start our attack with their uh, uh, illegible word. Never wait. Never talk about us. Only them. Dang, son. I get that. You know, but even when we talk to people who criticize the Catholic faith, do you, are you ever okay talking about things that you also have difficulties with or things you don't understand? I do. Use their blood, sex, crime to get headlines. Don't use us. This guy, man, can you imagine the foaming at the mouth going on? The kind of fangs and the horns that grew as he was typing? I speak from 15 years of experience in this. There has never yet been an attack who was not reeking with crime. All we had to do was look for it and murder would come out. (laughs) Murder! They fear our meter. Dude, I have seen the meter. I have seen it. I used to work at a place. I used to work at a place um, called Studio One. Scientologists would probably know of it. They made like the skin, if I remember right, the skin for the uh, animatronics or whatever, the the um, technology, you know, uh, Dumbo Drop, for example, E.T., to make it look real. They also did the the orca for the SeaWorld exhibit where it's you can see an orca in the water and it, it's giving birth. So you're seeing the, uh, the birthing of an orca, right? They're the ones who did a lot of that stuff with that. Um, I used to work there, okay? That place is not only run, it's not only owned and operated by a Scientologist. I was one of maybe three people working there who were not Scientologists. And it was weird because we'd sit around the table during lunch and stuff, and these people, they, would, they, they I remember sickness just spread around like crazy over there. And it was one time with the manager, man, she's like your supervisor. She's all like super sick, man. Her eyes look sunken in. She's like, uh, 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 and barely able to breathe, hacking up a lung all over the place, wiping her snot all over her hands uh, uh, and wiping her on the table. And we're all looking at why we're trying to eat food. And she's holding on to this meter thing. I, I, yeah. And I'm like, are you sick? No, you're not. Maybe you should go to the doctor. No way. You need medicine. Oh no, I'm good. I've got, I've got this thing. <laughs> what is that? What is that? Other than you are super spreading whatever sickness you've got. <laughs> She's calling us all like it's a family dinner, sitting at the head of the table, coughing up a lung over everybody. We're like, dang girl. Dang. You should maybe consider staying home. I don't fear the meter, are you nuts? They fear freedom. What? They fear the way we're growing. Why? Because they have too much to hide. (laughs) Look at the us, them coming out and that. It's one thing for us to say, everybody is a sinner. We all are. For them, they're like, anyone who's against us, they have too much to hide. If we investigate them, you're going to find murder. Know what a weirdo. Yeah. His personal qualifications as a religious leader were everything but saintly. His first two marriages were disastrous. His second wife, Sarah Northrop Hubbard, sued him for divorce on April 23rd, 1951. The microfilm copy of that case mysteriously vanished from the court records. However, an industrious St. Petersburg Times newspaper reporter found the original in storage at the courthouse. It was a 28-page complaint to dissolve their Chestertown, Maryland marriage of August 10th, 1946. This was a bigamous marriage for Mr. Hubbard. So, okay, wow. So, homeboy is all sorts of bigamous, <laughs> right? Their, their marriage. They're like, they're, they're hooking up with other people. 
It's a little bit open, if you know what I'm saying. It's a little bit open. Yeah. And who is he open with? This is where it gets real weird. I mean, it's already weird when you're like, you know, in one of those relationships like that. It's kind of like, dang, you know, that's a bad idea. I don't think that's very good. You should maybe consider not being a pervert. And by maybe, I mean, there's a confession line. You should go. He pretended to be a bachelor to Mrs. Northrup, yet he had not divorced his first wife. So, okay, forgive me. I skipped ahead. I skipped ahead. So, so his, his, his relationship was he was already married. He had not dissolved his marriage yet. Now, I know some sickos like this, actually, that think that that's perfectly fine. And they're like, oh, yeah. And, and the crazy thing is the kind of um, um, moral gymnastics that they, the reasoning that they do, their moral reasoning to justify what they're doing, especially if they, if they confess Christianity in their mouths. And you go, okay, so you're a Christian, you are still married, and you're trying to make a baby with someone else who's also married and not divorced yet. And you're trying to do that. Uh, and they're like, they're like, uh, yeah, um, we believe that that Christ came to set us free. We're free indeed. What? Wow, man. Wow, your hermeneutic is complete trash. <laughs> That's garbage. And where does that one end, by the way? It well, it typically ends at what they excuse for themselves. Because if you say, uh, yeah, murder, well, no, man, that's not right. Terrorism. Oh, what? Genocide. Infanticide. Oh, no. No, I just mean, you know, hooking it up fat with some other man's wife and not letting my wife know about it and trying to make babies. How dare you judge me? (laughs) We're free indeed. We're not under the law anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, by the way, people who, people who do that, and, I, and I'm speaking, I won't say the guy's name, I'm speaking to him, you're a scumbag, you are a scumbag. You need to get your life back together with the Lord, dude. You know it, too, deep down inside. If you're watching the show, you know it, dude. And sorry for breaking that wall, everybody, but the truth is, it's a real person. And I know him. Let's see. His second wife, his second wife's 1951 divorce allegations claimed sleep deprivation, beatings, strangulation, kidnapping of their child, and fleeing to Cuba, and Ron counseling her to commit suicide, if she really loved him. Now, look, that's the drama of a court. You're going to hear some crazy, wild accusations being made. But if even if any of these things are true to any degree, you say, wow, man. Wow, bro. Strangulation? I wasn't choking her that bad. <laughs> kidnapping? Holy cow. Counseling to commit suicide. If you really love me, you kill yourself. Imagine that guy. Sarah Northrup had first met Hubbard through a Pasadena-based occult group led by Jack Parsons. And this is where it gets diabolical. As if it's not already. It's just, it's terribly unethical. Riddled with lies. But now just straight up, just demonology stuff, right? Now we're entering the world of the diabolical. Big time. Jack Parsons. If you don't know, he is a disciple of the late Aleister Crowley, whose alias was the Beast 666. <laughs> so you're like, oh, who is who's that guy? Oh, he, he, that guy over there? Yeah, his name's Aleister. Oh, oh, that's his name? Well, he has a nickname. What's that? The Beast 666. <laughs> okay, wow. Did he give that to himself? Crowley was a leading Satanist, sorcerer, and black magician. I would just say magician because saying black magician is like he's a black dude. (laughs) Uh, You put evil magician. Diamond Brothers are going to come at me. they're, they're, They're of the persuasion that any kind of illusion like that, any kind, is just obviously from the devil. 
Even examples of like dudes walking on water, which is hilarious because you can watch a video on how it was done with a pane of glass right beneath the surface of the water and the tricks that they do with the cameras where people swim underneath and wave so that it looks as though it, it, it lends to the suspended disbelief that the viewer has. They don't even get it. They're like, oh, this guy invoking magical powers. Brah. Brah. He founded the Ordo. We're talking, it's still uh, uh, um, Crowley. Ordo Templi Orientis, the OTO, which promoted sexual magic. So we're into the Father Yod stuff, the sex magic. Weird, weird junk with that, by the way. The group's historical record includes letters between Parsons and Crowley that mentions Hubbard several times. So, so Parsons, he's down with this, this satanic sickness, and he's talking a lot about Hubbard. What's he talking about? Northrop was Parsons' girlfriend when they met. So when they met L. Ron Hubbard, right, Northrop was Parsons' girlfriend. So who would later become L. Ron Hubbard's wife? As Parsons' partner, she represented the Babylonian woman in Revelation chapter 17. So that, that was their connection. They're like, oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. You know, we, uh, let's see. Okay, no, Jack Parsons' alias was the B666. Sorry about that. Yeah, Jack, I, I, the reading, I mistook that. Jack Parsons. So his alias is the B666, and he's with a woman doing some sexual magic. And that woman is the Babylonian woman in Revelation chapter 17. But before she could fulfill Parsons' plan, Hubbard swept her away <laughs> in an out-of-state bigamous marriage. Rep representing himself as a bachelor the entire time. Can you imagine that scenario? Darn you! My cult, my satanic plans have been foiled by L. Ron Hubbard. The bigamist, L. Ron. Should we be grateful? <laughs> I, I, it's a serious question, guys. Like, Should we be grateful for that? Like, uh, they're both wicked bad. You know, but I mean, at least he foiled the plan. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's one thing to be in Scientology. It's another thing to be the Babylonian woman in Revelation 17, uh, 17 that's hooking it up fat with the beast 666 in sexual magic rituals. <laughs> at this point, guys, come on. In a weird way, maybe Scientology was a step in the right direction. <laughs> Things can get that bad in the kingdom of the cults. Scientology defends Hubbard's connection to the Parsons' black magic cult by stating that he went undercover to infiltrate it in order in uh, orders of the naval intelligence. Oh, so he's like, oh no, you don't understand. Naval intelligence, they had me go in there to, to do investigations on this group. Supposedly, several prominent scientists were visiting Parsons' OTO temple and Ron's job, uh, Ron's job was to shut it down. Jack John Whiteside uh, Parsons was a noted rocket scientist. So it's true. So Parsons was actually a rocket scientist. No doubt about it. But the explanation presented by Hubbard seems kind of far-fetched. And why would that be, by the way? Because why would an undercover agent right, soil the operation with a big of his marriage? <laughs> but it's like, so you go in there, you're supposed to find all this out and you end up bolting because you end up hooking up fat with the bigamous marriage. Now, maybe that was part of the plan, too. Can you imagine? They're like, no, uh, you, you know, that's, uh, it's a long con. Oh, it's a long con. Yeah, a long con. I, I was in a bigamous marriage. It's true. But I needed to foil the plan. What? The sex magic plan for the Ordo. Uh, really? And how would you do that? By, you know, hooking up fat with... The leader's uh, bride or partner, it foiled the plan. It was real good. Did you marry that lady later? Yeah. <laughs> you believe that? You believe that? Yeah, my son out there sounds like he's real ticked. I don't know what's going on out there. I even gave him a day off, man. I said, take it easy today. You've been working really hard. For three years old, you know, 
the work week I got you doing, man, you really put in a lot of effort, man. <laughs> a lot of effort. Take your day off. But of course, no record has ever been produced to prove that naval intelligence hired Hubbard for such an operation. That would probably, would that even come out though, in fairness, to be quite frank? Would it? The resources claimed by Hubbard for Dianetics. So now we're on to Dianetics, right? What's Dianetics? What is this exactly, right? What is it? Let's see. No, it's Crawley. You're saying, okay, so it's Crawley. So it, as I said, it was kind of weird, man, the, 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 the way that he wrote this. Alistair Crowley, whose alias was the B666, okay. Okay, so he's, he's the B, so I got it messed up. Please forgive me about that. Please forgive me about that. And by the way, if I ever say anything, if I misread this, right? If I misread this or I, or I have something out of context and mix it up, let me know. And also in the, the afterglow, Make sure to do that. We put corrections and anything like that in there as well. I appreciate it, guys. The resources claimed by Hubbard for Dianetics include, quote, the medicine man of the Goldie people. Is it Goldie or Goldie? Goldie. People of Manchuria. The shamans of North Brunello. The Sioux medicine men. The cults of Los Angeles. The modern psychology. Among the people questioned about his existence were a magician whose ancestors served in the court of Kublai Khan and a Hindu who could hypnotize cats. <laughs> what? Where's this from? Oh, di it's, it's from Dianetics. <laughs> oh, I had to go to the footnotes. I'm like, dude, it's like Dr. Seuss. What is this? <laughs> What is this? Read it again. The medicine man. So these are the sources. These are the resources claimed. He's like, look, I went, I went real deep, guys. I dug real deep for this one. And you're like, oh, you did? I traveled the world. I got crazy resources. Mega awesome. It's totally verified. And you're like, oh, what kind of resources do you say? Oh, okay. Um, the medicine man uh, uh, from uh, the people of Manchuria. What? The shamans of North Brunel. What? Sue medicine men. Okay. I, I, the cults of Los Angeles. Dude, really? <laughs> I, I went around and I talked to a lot of cults. Isn't that where Unarius was? Were they, in, were they in LA? I don't know if they were in LA. Where were they? <laughs> was, was he talking to Unarius? In modern psychology, among the people questioned about its existence were a magician. Oh, a magician. Who's and was he a black guy? <laughs> was he a black was he a black magician? <laughs> oh. And and what, what are the credentials for the magician? So the guy during the day, he's like, pick a card, any card. But his ancestors served in the court of Kublai Khan in a Hindu who could hypnotize cats. Dang, son! Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! Dude, homeboy is monocled out. He's all like this to the cats. Right? He's all like this. He's like, go to sleep, little kitty, kitty. Kitty, 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 kitty. Go to sleep. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to find that regression? You're going to talk to the cats? Talk about them past lives. Meow, 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 meow. <laughs> you know, were you around during this time? <laughs> oh, dude, yeah, that's an affirmative. He's hypnotizing cats. Dabbles had been made in mysticism. Dabbles. He's, he's dabbling. Little dab here, little dab there. He's dabbing it up. Yeah. <laughs> Dabbles had been made in mysticism. Data had been studied from mythology to spiritualism. So, okay, for those who think it's just a philosophy, at this point, is this dude just a straight-up cultist yet or not? I mean, I'm dead serious. Just think about it. 
who's going to study for an authority, a manual that claims to have this kind of authority, the super secret special insight into the universe, into who we are, into the, the true nature of the things. And he's talking to dudes. He's talking to magicians. All right. Maybe not even black magicians. <laughs> he was racist. So he's probably not even talking to black magicians. And he's talking to people hypnotizing cats. And he's talking to cults in L.A. Hubbard's third marriage to Mary Sue Whip lasted the rest of his lifetime. She captivated worldwide attention in 1977 as the mastermind behind a sinister covert operation against various levels of the United States government that could rival a spy novel. Now, that might sound kind of interesting. <laughs> his third marriage, Mary Sue Whip, it lasted the rest of his life. But she got a bunch of attention the year before I was born. And what was it? As the mastermind of what? That sounds, you know, what was it? An operation against various levels of the U.S. government. Hubbard spent his final years in seclusion from the public eye. No wonder. No wonder. Would you? And how would they not, they wrap him up in this? Listen, in their refusal to believe that such a great, quote, science of the mind master could die a horrific death, the word dead or died was never used at his eulogy. Scientologists announced that L. Ron Hubbard uh, decisively discarded the body. So they're one of those, it's like, it's like Unarius, like the cult Unarius, where the wife, she's talking about her husband, the fact that he died, and she's like, uh, you earthlings would, would call it death. He was actually transformed. He was, he was elevated to another dimension. Wow, that's amazing. That's really powerful. All of us earthlings, we call it death. Because it's death. Homeboy died. To move on to the next level of research outside his body. How this new research would become available to planet Earth is, of course, left unsaid. So nobody knows. Nobody knows. How is it possible? You know? How is it possible? You know, so he's left the body. Right? He's done that whole thing. Wow, he's left the body. He's in some other dimension. Wow. And he's doing that. And he's up there typing away. 90 words a minute. Typing away. How are we going to get it? Oh, I didn't never tell us that. Wow. Maybe they got some super secret channel. They can maybe ask the hypnotized cat. The Dianetics Movement. As an accomplished science fiction writer, Hubbard had no difficulty coining new terms. This talent became the bedrock for new terminology in Dianetics and Scientology. Church publications often contain glossaries and new terms. They also publish a technical dictionary with 3,000 new terms and definitions, probably more now. It is interesting, however, that the word Scientology was originally used in 1934 by a German social psychologist, Dr. A. Nerdenholz, a French psychologist, Richard uh, Semin, coined Engram in 1904. Engram is one of the most commonly used words in Dianetics and Scientology. Now, Scientology or Dianetics means through thought or through the soul. And the way they the way they phrase it is this, right? The structure of man's mind is simplified by dividing the mind into three main categories, the analytical mind, reactive mind, and somatic mind. The analytic mind works like a, quote, perfect computer. It never makes a mistake. That's amazing. That, by the way, would have to be a divine revelation. You're talking religion. You know, you're talking religion. It never makes a mistake. It, uh, it is also the eye of the person. So the I, the you, right? The one that says, I like this, I like that. That part, the analytical mind, works like a perfect computer, it never makes a mistake. The reactive mind works on, quote, a, to a, a totally stimulus response basis. So it's reacting, right? Stimulus response. 
The reactive mind holds mental pictures, these images of past experiences called engrams. So the way that it works, it says that this, this reactive mind contains a whole bunch of images that are these composites of things that you've experienced, that you've sensed in the world. And these they call engrams. Which are apparently the single source of aberrations and psychosomatic ills. Some liken the reactive mind to the subconscious mind. The analytical and reactive minds direct the somatic mind and, quote, place solutions into effect on the physical level. This mind keeps the body regulated and functioning. Now, okay, so that, that's his idea for, for how things are known, how memories, you know, what are memories, how do they affect our decisions, what is the I, right, of us, the letter I, like me. The problem of humanity for them is that the reactive mind frequently interrupts the analytic mind. The analytical mind, which essentially is the person, could flawlessly run a person's life, being a perfect computer, except for the interference from the reactive mind. So the analytical mind, remember, the, anal the analytical mind would be perfect, but this, this reactive mind is constantly interrupting. And it's interrupting by, by infusing into that, interjecting into that, images that may be skewed. It makes it, it's like, it's, it's, it's you got to get it out. It's a wicked bad filter, making you super creepy. It appears that this villain of the analytical mind causes it to shut off. Scientology calls this, mo this a moment of unconsciousness. Hubbard explains, quote, When the individual is unconscious in full or in part, the reactive mind is cut in, in full or in part. When he is fully conscious, his analytical mind is fully in command of the organism, end quote. But during these unconscious moments, the reactive mind takes in detailed recordings from the sensory organs. So it's basically recording and storing, recording and storing, recording and storing. But this recording is not a memory, but an image. Like a motion picture called an engram. Everything said, seen, touched, or sensed is recorded by the reactive mind as the engram. The reactive mind stores this engram, which, can sit, which works to stimulate the person to react to the stimulus. Yeah. So you have you have all of this, right? So so yeah, somebody somebody in the chat said this sounds like medieval scholasticism with techno sci-fi language, <laughs> a little bit, right? Maybe maybe minus the perfect the perfect knowledge of that, right? But the operations get all bundled. I can imagine I can imagine some of that. By the way, I wondered, uh, um, you know, and, and and we'll talk about this here in a second, the idea of clear. Okay, in fact, that, that's the next part coming up. Oh, yeah, op operating themes. Okay, so so um, the idea of clear. I wondered, like, if any of you seen Walking Dead, right? You got, you got, oh, boy, in The Walking Dead, right, talking about clear. I'm not clear, Rick. I'm not clear. Let's see. Yeah, let me, let me make sure I got it right. So, clear... Uh, clear Walking Dead. Yeah. Yeah, so, the, but the idea, right? The idea in it, let's see, Platt, you got this here, let's see. There's Lincoln, Rick. Um, yeah, so you got, you got a whole bunch of these people in there. Right, uh, basically in clear, um, you've got you've got this idea that um, you know the brain's not working right, and he's got to clear, he's got to clear, he's got to clear, and and he's he's troubled by all of these images from past experiences, his wife dying, 
his son dying. And he's trying really hard to get clear. And I and, and just keep that in mind. If you've seen that, keep it in mind. <laughs> keep it in mind as we uh as we talk about this. Because what does clear mean in the walking dead? Okay. Give me a second. Oh, yeah, because you get Morgan Jones. I was trying to remember his name, not just Lenny James. Lenny James is the actor. Morgan Jones, okay? So Morgan Jones, he's, he's, he's in this room. He's in this room. He's trying to, you know, um, he's, he's trying to keep himself safe. He's surrounding himself with all of these objects and stuff. And he's got all these weapons, and he's writing clear all over the wall. You're not clear. You're not clear. I'm not clear, Rick. And it becomes this big thing over and over. It's obnoxious, in fact. But what does it take to be clear? I wondered. One of the one of the cast members was a Scientologist. Caused actually a number of problems. Okay. So this is the example given, right, to the idea of the person reacting to the stimulus. Quote, suppose as an example of an engram and its effects on the spirit, Mr. A has a, ton, a, a, a tonsillectomy under anesthetic. D- during the operation... The surgeon who wears glasses comments angrily to a clumsy nurse. You don't know what you're doing. Mr. A recovers. A few months later, Mr. A, a bit tired during a hard day at the office, has an argument with his employer, who happens to also wear glasses, who says, you don't know what you're doing. Mr. A suddenly feels dizzy, stupid, and gets a pain in his throat. There is installed a kind of conditioned uh, uh, semantic response that affects the Thetan, a cyclical reincarnated entity <laughs> discovered, of course, by Elron. These engrams make him react insanely in society. In fact, they make a man mad, insufficient, and ill. Mad, insufficient, and ill. How about this? You want to talk about mad and ill? For one, you want to hear madness and illness and something messed up that's going to make you have pain in your throat and feel dizzy and stupid. You got to hear space jazz. Earth, my beautiful home. (laughs) The Scientology space jazz. It's garbage. (laughs) You're You're going to feel all sorts of whack, dude. You're going to be all messed up from that all messed up but more than that more than that okay let me let me get up here and see let me get up here and make sure i get get the right one here yeah talking about talking about the uh the the policy about them coming against the government we'll talk about that in a second mad ill wicked bad The solution to the reactive mind interrupting the analytical mind is to rid the reactive mind of all engrams. Once this is accomplished, the person is called clear. The clear person has no reaction to the same situation because no engram stimulates it. Again, dude, walking dead. I'm not even joking. (laughs) Walking dead. The goal of Dianetics is to clear the individual of all engrams of his past. Because he keeps seeing the dead ghosts. He keeps seeing the dead kids in the show. At first, Dianetics only dealt with engrams in this lifetime. After more probing, Scientologists claim that they carry engrams from past lives. Reincarnation. That also need to be cleared. Wow! They probably did learn that in in speaking to the cultists over at Unarius. Unarius people, they not only believe that kind of thing, but they believe that the way to get it out rather than just getting rid of those thoughts, is to embrace them. And to embrace them in a way that you, that you put yourself back in that place that you believe that you've been reincarnated from. And they do that through screenplays. So they, they write, they do acting, play acting. So they might believe, yeah, I was, one of the people made the claim that they were one of those who crucified our Lord. It's on a video. They, they talk about, yeah, I was one of those guys. So what do they do? They reenact it. And to them, it's really, you know, this catharsis that comes over them 
and all of that, or the things that happened a long time ago around, you know, around a fire. They were all tribal in a jungle. Or maybe in the future, looking like robots on other planets. And they make videos out of that. They have tons of them. So for them, they wouldn't be clearing them per se. They'd be embracing it. Identifying with it to better understand themselves. The clear person is on the evolutionary journey to the next stage of man. A godlike being called Homo Novus. Hubbard informs us that a clear individual, quote, can be tested for all psychoses, neuroses, compulsions, and, and repressions, all aberrations, and can be examined for any autogenic, self-generated diseases referred to as psychosomatic ills. These tests confirm the clear to be entirely without such ills or aberrations. Additional tests of this intelligence indicate it to be high above the current norm. So you're going to be, you're not going to have any psychosomatic problem. You're not going to have any mental illness. You're going to be super dupe smart. You just got to hook up to the E-meter. You got to get in out it. That's like the satanic version of our confessional, by the way. Hubbard continues the potential expectation for the clear. It improves eyesight, stops ear ringing, increases the IQ, cures the common cold. Uh, speeds thinking computations 120 times faster than normal, and it saves marriages. You know, that's crazy. That's wild. The first bunch of things are things that he could have really benefited from back when he was, you know, going to the hospital all the time in the Navy for his headaches and tum-tums. And the latter one could have helped with maybe him processing his thoughts a little better to realize that he was leading a cult down a uh, slippery slide to H-E double hockey sticks. <laughs> And maybe to save marriages. Right. It's a little late. A little late to the game. Poor guy. The application of his hypothesis is to vanquish all the engrams through Dianetic therapy. This is accomplished by an auditor who audits the engram through a form of counseling. After Dianetics was published, Hubbard introduced the electronic uh, galvanometer, the e-meter, to help in auditing. So how does how does this work? Hey Angela, are you able to give me give me give me some canned food? <laughs> you gotta give me give me two cans. You gotta be, give me two cans, baby. That's what we gotta do. Yeah. I don't know if she can hear me. Yeah, get Wolf in there. Make Wolf do it. He's tall enough. <laughs> I'm a one and a half year old. Yeah, but what is this? Right? The idea, American Psychological Association initiated the first concerted action against Dianetics in 1950. A resolution which put it in the manual, <laughs> but it wasn't available. It wasn't available. Yeah, so so the idea, I was hoping my wife would bring in some of those cans for real. Baby, come on now. You got to get to it, woman. It's also an excuse to get a little kiss on the cheek. Angela, come on, baby. Don't let your boy down. I got to have the cans. And some string. And some string. Oh, I think, yeah, th yeah, she's coming. I can hear it now. I need some cans. I know, like soup cans. You got cream corn, baby. Come on now. No, I don't care. I just need two cans. My wife's out there. She's like, are you empty ones or full ones? I just need some cans, baby. <laughs> Come on now. I need the cans. <laughs> the life of the Kaiser. I mean, come on. It's rough. It's real rough. But it always ends up working out for the good. Believe me, trust me. Trust me, it's just happening. So the way that this thing works, right? You have a pre-clear person. So you have somebody. 
You have somebody who uh, is not clear yet. And they're getting together. They're getting together with an auditor. And this auditor is going to be asking them a whole bunch of questions. Because they need to get down into the depth of that brain. They're saying, look, your analytic, your analytical mind, that bugger is an awesome computer. It is like so perfect. If you could just have that. And you're like, what's the problem? Well, the problem is you had a bunch of me- like images, not memories per se, they're like images. And these images get bundled in, you know, zoink, zoink into the analytical processes. And it makes it difficult for you to make good decisions. And in those moments where that takes over, you become unconscious. And what we're trying to do is, oh, hey, and. Not only my wife, you have failed me. <laughs> Look at this. Come on, man. Not only has she still not gotten me cans, now I got my kids coming in. Now I got my kids. Oh, I got Wolf in here, Louie in here, and no cans. <laughs> you are killing me, woman. I did too. Did you We're can. live. <laughs> I got you, Ken. You better kiss me on the cheek. The other one. I can't get the other one. You gotta get the other one. I can't, I can't do it with only one cheek being kissed. Come on now. Come on. (laughs) Get over. There we go. I forgive you. This time. (laughs) This time. (laughs) People like this is a long time. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So they've got it's it looks like this. (laughs) They've got. They've got their cans, and they got to hold these two, these two cans, right? They hold two tin cans connected by wires to the E-meter, while the auditor sits opposite him watching the needle on the E-meter. So you're all like this. You're all, you're all waiting. You're holding on to the cans, and you're like, you're like, okay, what is it showing? And they're asking questions, and you're revealing a whole bunch about yourself, holding these two dumb cans. That's what you're doing. Uh, what, what the heck is this? Oh, hey, hold on. I'm watching the meter go up and down. <laughs> this thing works? It kind of looks like the it kind of looks like the phone I used to use when I was a kid. Uh, it's based on the same tech. The one with the string with I have it go to my friend's house up the road and we would try to talk cuz that thing never worked. It, it did. You just didn't have the magical eyeballs or ears to hear it. Oh, uh, you do? Yes, I'm reading. I'm reading the dial. Don't you see? Powerful tech. Well, I didn't realize you could take it, derive it from that. <laughs> They're all growing up. They're all growing up with their friends. Hey, yo, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, yeah. One day, this is going to be used by a real weirdo who says that it works to get engrams out of your brain so you can be a perfect computer. What's that? I didn't hear you. Forget it. (laughs) Uh. Now, by tracking the engram through questioning the pre-clear, they can erase engrams. That may be only the beginning of the problem, though, for the pre-clear. They may detect other engrams in connection with the first, producing a chain of them. It may take years of auditing for a person to become finally clear. And after that, you've not only told them tons of your deepest and darkest secrets that they have no obligation to keep private, that they constantly use against you in a freakish, diabolical, dangerous, delusional way. But then they also end up raking you over the calls for money. My friend I worked with at Studio One, she went one time to one of their meetings. It was hundreds of dollars, like back in the 90s, like 400 bucks. And it was a lot of sitting in a hot tub. Just dumb. Another problem was that there were no clears. They could be found until 66. When John McMaster was called the world's first clear. Yeah. Of course, critics were like, well, why isn't Hubbard? Why, why isn't he clear? But here's the thing. There was actually another instance in 1950. 
On August 10th, Hubbard rented the Shrine Auditorium. Oh, yeah, okay. In Los Angeles. An estimated crowd of 4,000 came to see the world's first clear, Miss Sonia Bianca. Sonia, she's the first one. She's a physics student from Boston. Hubbard announced that she had perfect recall and could remember every moment of her life. Wow, big claim. It would be easy to disprove this, by the way. Easy. Why? Because members of the audience questioned her. She couldn't even remember basic physics formulas, nor the color of Hubbard's necktie, which had been seen, you know, moments before. Yeah, man. Of course, he had an explanation. Imagine it being in the moment. Everybody, the clear is finally here. I brought you all together today so that you can see the clear. And you go, wow, dude, okay. Okay, let's see. Oh, come on up. Sonia, she has perfect recall. She remembers everything in life. She, you know, he steps behind her. Hey, Sonia. Yes? What is, uh, what, what color is Mr. Hubbard's tie? I don't know. <laughs> Hubbard's like, oh, crud. <laughs> oh, snap, what? You can imagine him just wanting to just smack her. He's like, how dare you? How dare you? Uh, he's got to come up quick. Those gears are just grinding in his head. I got to come up with some sweats dripping down the side. He's starting to, he's starting to reveal that future person that we talked about. That really portly, gross-looking, sweaty, long-haired, gross version of the original Doctor Who meets, you know, Christopher Hitchens and has a, a you know, a demonic love baby, right? That kind of thing. And he's like, oh, I, I, I placed her in the now by calling, come out now. Therefore, Harvard reasoned, she could only remember the present now. In other words, she can only know stuff. So all you got to do is say, but we asked her, we called her Sonia. And how long is now? <laughs> what a stupid thing. No. And it's weird too, because the Journal of Scientology, 1954, Hubbard wrote that he did, he'd cleared 50 people. Yeah, man. Yeah. We'll talk about we'll talk about some of this other stuff next time. But I, I want to mention just real quick. I just want to mention before moving on some of the deadly parts too. This is the last part. Okay. There were apparently more than five thousand Scientologists involved in one of the most clandestine uh, covert spying operations ever aimed at the United States government. More than five thousand. Quite accidentally, two Scientologists working undercover using a phony IRS badge to gain entrance to the Assistant U.S. Attorney Gen uh, Attorney's Office made a grave mistake, and the cover was blown. The three-year operation had come to a screeching halt. Wow. So they were involved in a covert operation against the government. What was it about? Eleven top Scientologists were indicted in 1977. They named Mary Sue Hubbard, wife of the founder and director of the operation, among those charged with the crime. Court evidence, numbering approximately 33,000 documents, connected Scientologists to infiltrating the government, burglarizing, bugging, wiretapping, and stealing classified information. The operation targeted, quote, the Federal Trade and Atomic Energy Commissions, the National Security Defense Intelligence Agencies, the Departments of Labor, Army, and Navy, the U.S. Customs Service, Interpol, and numerous U.S. police departments. Holy cow! Wow! What the heck? A three-year operation involving his wife. Holy cow! L. Ron Hubbard and 24 other Scientologists were named conspirators, but they were not indicted. Mary Sue Hubbard and four top Scientologists were given five-year prison terms and fined 
$10,000 each. Now, the Church of Scientology, we'll end with this. The Church of Scientology argues that it has long been oppressed by the American government. Okay, I hear you. I get that. Part of it's that you're a cult. Part of it is that you are a complete freakazoid. But if this were true, then criminal activity is not the correct solution. <laughs> wow, is this man? Wow, is this dude? Like, if you if you're like, hey, look, we're being suppressed. Well, what should you do? Uh, a three year operation trying to infiltrate multiple departments inside the U.S. government. What? What? That's like when, when you see these documentaries and they're like, how dare you say that, that we're like, you know, creepy and we're always monitoring people and everything else. And then it's quite blatantly obvious that they're monitoring the documentarian. It's obvious. Like it was one where they, they, had, to, they had to lie and, and get a plane ticket to a different place and then, and then drive in a car using only cash to get to a different place like in Florida or something. I think they started in maybe Louisiana or something like that. They, they end up going to Florida or Texas and went to Louisiana, I forget. But they, they, they go from west to east. They get to that place. They go on top of a building in a parking garage on the top floor. And as they're beginning to do their thing, all of a sudden, guess what? Don't, don't, don't. Up come a bunch of black SUVs. Homeboy Scientologist comes out with a bunch of papers. Uh, I'll show you right now. You want to know the real truth. Blah, 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 blah. And he's like in their face. And you go, dude, how did you get here? Or that you are like, we're not, we're not tracking you. And then you get to your hotel and homeboy's waiting, sitting there, having waited for hours, waiting for you. We're not tracking you. What? That's like the last thing you want to do if you want to get your message out. That's the last thing you want to do if you want to dispel the supposed myth that you are a freaky deaky organization. This is a dark shadow for operating thetans who are supposedly, quote, clear. Oh, yeah, in those, in operating thetan, by the way, um, you know, are people who are supposedly cleared. So this would be a lot of them involved in that. Supposedly cleared of all wrong answers or useless answers that keep them from living or thinking. Yeah. That's why they ended up conducting business out of a uh, uh, out of government's reach for a while. Right? They were aboard a floating headquarters, the Apollo, and it was in international waters. There's a new floating office, the Free Winds. Caribbean crews where a lot of this stuff goes on. Another recent development has been the multi-million dollar construction of a nuclear proof vault tunneled into Walker Mountain. That's near Eureka, California, to store L. Ron Hubbard's writings. So they're like, oh, millions of dollars. We need to preserve the writings. We need to preserve them from nuclear attack. They need to stay forever. But they're not a religion. <laughs> Dang, dude. Come on. And of course, lastly, they have a, you know, successful drug rehabilitation program called Narconon, a criminal rehabilitation program, Criminon. <laughs> Doesn't that sound cheap and, you know, kind of gay, like G-H-E-Y? <laughs> Doesn't it kind of sound that way? Uh, yeah, what, what's your, what's your uh, you know, your rehabilitation program for drugs? Uh, Narconon. Okay. What about criminal rehabilitation? Criminon. <laughs> yeah. What's the overall, like, you have a program for, like, understanding, like, your catechism? Stupid on. <laughs> uh, yeah. So next time, we, next time we get together, we're going to talk about, we're going we're gonna to dive into the Church of Scientology, what it is. You know, we're going to talk about what a thetan is, the religious nature of that. We're going to talk about their ideas uh, regarding... Um, uh, self, sex, group, mankind, other life forms, MEST, spirits, supreme being. What is an operating thetan? Their ideas about, yeah, matter, energy, space, and time, mest. Their physics of the universe. We're going to talk about that. 
And now OTs have to climb 15 levels, but that the highest courses are obtainable by only a few members. And of course, we are also going to out what is already public information anyway. They're super duper, not very hidden anymore. Mega poo poo trash nonsense secret. Until then though, until then, you gotta go right now. Go over to Telegram in the in the description below, okay? In the description below, you're gonna see the Wolfpack chat. That is where you are going to find the Q and A after show. But there's so much more there, okay? We are there, uh, we have a book club. The book club is being led by uh, Haley Luya in the chat. Right? A lot of people in the chat you'll see over there too, and and so she's leading that, going through chapter by chapter of the book Catholic Controversy: Defense of the Faith. St. Francis de Sales. We did some a, a series on that, including the video we did against set of Vacantism at the end of it. If you haven't seen it, make sure to check out the, the full catalog, which you can find, of course, in the description below. But you've also got a prayer chain. Now you have a prayer group. People every single day are, are uh, praying for the intentions of other people. Over 300 prayer requests at this point. Maybe even 350. And we, we have great times celebrating, having fun, Every 50 people that we get in the room when we get to 200, we started at 50, you know, 50, 100, 150, 200, all the way up. Every single 50, we end up doing another party, eating food, streaming video, movies, having fun, right? Talking to each other, praying with each other, late into the night, theology, philosophy, apologetics, dating, marriage, parenting, culture, the, cr the crazy clown world we're in, and praying for each other, making friends. So make sure to go check it out. It's totally awesome. And your boy's there, right? Every day doing, doing different live chats, okay? Sometimes up to two hours. It's tons of fun. You're all amazing people in my life. And I'm grateful for all of you. You really have made this an awesome thing. I can truly say that I love what I do and I do what I love. And it's because of you. Everything else is on the screen and in the descriptions. Until next time, never give up. Keep on smiling and memento more. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.